Assalamu alaikum, good morning, and hi, everyone. Thank you to all the participants who have gathered here today for our hybrid webinar, Ideas Malaysia Outlook Conference 2022. Thank you to all our participants joining in through the Zoom link and Facebook Live. We hope you will enjoy the session today, and if you have any questions, feel free to leave the questions at the Q&A box, and we'll bring your questions to the floor. My name is Sal Sabir Abdul Manan, Executive Program Secretariat of the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs Ideas, and I'm honored to be your MC for our conference today. Please allow me to begin with a short housekeeping announcement. At IDEAS, we are committed to provide a safe environment for all parties, both internal and external, to work together. IDEAS has a policy of zero tolerance towards sexual exploitation and abuse. Everyone here today is responsible for making this event a safe space for public discourse. In addition to that, due to the rising cases of COVID-19, we would like to request for the speakers and participants to adhere to the social distancing throughout the session. This includes wearing a mask, using hand sanitizers, and always being vigilant during the whole event. To officially begin our event today, allow me to invite Yang Ahmad Mulia, Tunku Zain Al Abidin Ibn Tuanku Muhris, founding president of the Institute for <coughs> Democracy and Economic Affairs Ideas, to give his welcoming remarks. Please welcome. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum and good morning, everyone. Um, delighted that all of you are able to join us on Zoom. Um, and uh, it looks like it's going to be a fantastic conference. We've got some amazing speakers, and I think we're really going to be discussing issues that are of interest and of much uh, importance to, to all of us. Uh, this is the second um, Malaysia Outlook Conference hosted by Ideas, and the first of which was born out of the pandemic uh, last year, when it was not possible to hold our physical annual dinner uh, to celebrate our, uh, our anniversary. Um, and although Malaysia has undergone recovery, we are seeing the beginning of endemicity. Uh, we nonetheless find ourselves victims again of COVID thanks to the Omicron wave. So we've again had to postpone our annual dinner uh, from the originally planned date of 10th March, i.e. tomorrow, uh, to the 25th of August uh, later on in the year and usefully close to Merdeka as well. So as such, by default, uh, the MOC, this Malaysia Outlook Conference, has become another one of ideas as a way of celebrating um, our anniversary. And indeed, we are 12 years old this year. And, and then we started, we were one of the earliest uh, or fledgling think tanks in town. It was just, uh, you know, three of us um, who, were, who knew each other in London, who uh, saw the think tank scene there and said, let's try and do something for Malaysia and create an independent think tank. So uh, the Malaysia Think Tank London evolved to become the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs uh, 12 years ago. And since then, we've really welcomed friends and colleagues who've set up numerous think tanks of their own. Um, and um, of course, every, every think tank has their own niche. Every think tank has their own uh, ideology or principles behind what they're trying to do. But all of us share the belief that you can achieve things, you can influence legislation, you can influence policy uh, without being in uh, party politics uh, necessarily. And I think most of us uh, strongly believe um, that research and evidence, as far as possible, should be uh, the tools and the instruments that are used to achieve these changes. So I'm happy to see four different think tanks represented on the first panel on policymaking uh, in a post-pandemic world. Um, apart from ideas, we have Penang Institute, Bait al Amana, and the Centre. Now, the reason we formulated this Malaysia Outlook Conference is because we recognised that there is no singular conference at the start of the year that sets the tone for all aspects of an outlook for Malaysia. And, of course, we, we don't claim to have all the answers, but we do believe in the importance of establishing platforms that connect important stakeholders together in discussing the most important themes of the times. So this, this time we'll be looking at the political developments of 2022 ahead of the imminent Johor state election and the highly anticipated general election. And all eyes are rightly on Johor 
as a gauge and indicator as to whether the general election will be held later on in the year. And its outcomes will have implications on the way the country as well <coughs> moves forward. We also know that a series of economic lockdowns as a result of the pandemic, as well as the floods that took place in December last year, and indeed the floods we saw just a couple of days ago, um, have and may continue to hamper hopes of a rapid recovery. There's been a lot of talk about the EPF withdrawals, and I'm happy to see that the EPF will be represented at the very highest level uh, in our final panel today on economic recovery and resilience. And as the nation approaches an aging society, how well prepared are we really for the future? Ideas itself has long established itself as an institution that upholds liberty and justice in all we do. That's what we try to do. That's our guiding light. And we try to infuse those values in all of the work that we do, uh, regardless of the sector that it concerns uh, and regardless of the particular uh, stakeholders that we're talking to. Uh, we always try and bear in mind the words and the spirit and the example of uh, Tunku Abdul Rahman. Um, and uh, I think in these times, it's even more important to recall the vision uh, upon which our country really was uh, intended to be uh, and to remind especially younger Malaysians that uh, some of the disunity, some of the uh, racial, especially the racial tensions uh, were never uh, intended to remain. Uh, so we continue to make important inroads in the areas of public finance, democracy and governance, economics and business and social policy. And some of our most important policy victories over the last few years have been, um, for example, the Ministry of Finance publishing its pre-budget statement in efforts to improve Malaysia's standing in the Open Budget Index that Ideas was promoting and advocating act actively. Um, and we were consulted in that process in the budget transparency work. Uh, also working with the Ministry of Health on the rare diseases policy and roadmap, which we presented at an ASEAN level, making recommendations on how to improve public procurement within the MOF procurement division, and so much more. I think um, I go to a diversity of different types of conferences and diplomatic events and so on, and there's always someone who has something interesting, whether it be a criticism or a praise uh, for ideas or the work of my colleagues at ideas. And I'm very, you know, I'm very pleased that despite uh, everything that's going on, uh, there are an increasing, it seems to me that there are ever more uh, Malaysians and non-Malaysians living in Malaysia who appreciate the value that ideas and other think tanks are bringing to the democratic fabric of this nation. So our goal Continues to, uh, continues to remain uh, stimulating critical discourse among the public, uh, obviously now using multiple uh, platforms, technology platforms that allow policy recommendations to be promoted through interesting graphic ways uh, so it can better connect with a wider audience. And we'll continue to strive towards making public policy discussions uh, and discourse accessible more widely. So thank you to all of our supporters uh, over the years uh, without whom we, will, we would definitely not be able to be the institution that we are today. Thank you all very much again. Thank you, Yang Ahmad Mulia Tunku Zain. Without further ado, I would like to invite our esteemed speakers for the first topic on the stage entitled Policy Making in the Post-Pandemic World. Please welcome on stage Dr. Khairil Izamin Ahmad, CEO of the Centre, and Mr. Shayo, CEO of the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs Ideas. Please welcome on the stage as well, Dr. Zokri Idris, External Relations Director of Ideas, our moderator, for the session together with Mr. Arif Najmuddin, Research Executive at Ideas, our co-moderator for the first topic. For your information, another two speakers, Dr. Oi Ki Beng, Executive Director of Penang Institute, and Mr. Sharil Sabaruddin, Senior Fellow of Bait Al Amanah, will be joining us virtually through Zoom. With that, I would like to pass the session to the moderator, Dr. Zukri. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Sally, for the nice welcome. Being remarks. 
uh, as well as for the introductions. Once again, on behalf of the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs Malaysia, we'd like to welcome each and every one of you uh, to the second Malaysian Outlook Conference, one of IDEA's flagship events of the year. And particularly, I'd like to welcome and appreciate your presence to our first sessions of the day, entitled Policy Making in the Post-Pandemic World. Ladies and gentlemen, as the moderator of the day, I would have a great honor to introduce to you a line of esteemed speakers and panelists that will join me to discuss further and to decipher further to understand the industry of policy making in Malaysia, particularly in the post pandemic era. Now, joining me on stage, as also Ms. Sally has introduced before, we have the CEO of the center. Dr. Kamil Izamin Ahmad, thank you, Doctor, for being with us today. Also on the stage, we have Ms. Trisha Yeo, our CEO of Ideas Malaysia. Thank you, Trisha, for joining in. And joining us virtually, we have Yang Berbahagia, Datuk Dr. Oi Ki Bing, the Executive Director of Penang Institute. Hello, Doctor. If you can see me waving you from the stage. Uh, as well as we have um, the Senior Fellow of Bait Al Amana, Encik Shahil Sabarudin. Um, Encik Shahil, thank you for joining us today uh, for your information. Uh, this, the founding director of Bait Al Amana, uh, Professor Dr. Raza Ahmad, could not join us today and is been replaced by Encik Shahil from the same institution. Thank you once again. And also, I would like to also introduce to you our good-looking, handsome co-moderator, Mr. Arif Najmuni, will be assisting me in compiling the questions as well as moderating during the Q&A sessions. With that, to all of our viewers and listeners out there that are joining us online, if you do have questions, any opinions or feedback, criticisms or arguments as far as the topic is concerned, please do so by sharing your thoughts in the chat box that is available in Zoom, as well as to our Facebook viewers. You can also jot down in the comments box below, and our team will compile these questions, and um, Mr. Arif and myself will try our very best to air out these questions so that it will be addressed by the panelists of the day. So let me just go on starting the ground of the discussion today, ladies and gentlemen. Now, wh why do we choose the policy making in the post-pandemic world? As the founding president of IDEAS have said in, in the opening remarks, how IDEAS started with the conscience that Malaysia is in need of a policy making institution as part of our nation building process. Now, well, that was 20. 12, which is about like 12 years ago. And even right now, we, we see that the role and the need of having a policy-making institution is becoming more glaring than apparent. In the post-pandemic uh, world, or if we even trace back during the pandemic situations in 2020, the nation is not prepared. If we were not prepared to have a pandemic. Neither any of the nation states did. But what we actually learned a lesson that the, the COVID-19 is not only a health issue that is impacting our country, but has also has other implications in terms of economic downturn, in terms of social well-being of the country, in terms of infrastructure development. So it has other kinds of implications that the country is suffering. And not also to forget that within the pandemic era, we have a change of government uh, two times from 2020 until 2022. So certainly, I think the role of the policymakers and the think tank needs to be deciphered, needs to be thought of, so that we are not left behind in a nation building process. Each and every one of us, each of everyone of the think tanks has a role to play 
in a nation building process. So this is what the message that we are trying to tell you, ladies and gentlemen. And before I pass again to, to all of our speakers to, to present their thoughts and their views on this uh, policy making in a post pandemic world, some questions that we need to answer in our discussions today. Now, what are these questions? So we want what possibly that we can see the role of the think tank in engaging difficult and sensitive situations in Malaysia, as well as the sensitive discussions amongst the Malaysia and the grassroots in Malaysia. How can think tanks effectively listen, understand, and fight for the struggle of the grassroots out there so that no one is left behind in our process to become a developed nation? And last but not least, how does Think Tank places itself or position itself in a such increasingly complex and uncertain situation as we are having today? So these are the, among the main uh, problem statements or the questions that we will hope that we can decipher and understand further on our discussions today. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I, I've spoken much enough. I uh, just would like to welcome uh, the Executive Director of Penang Institute, uh, Dr. Dr. Oi Ki Ming, uh, to deliver his thought. Um, hi, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Zakri. Um, well, first, let me start by congratulating ideas for organizing these much needed initiatives. Thank you also for inviting me to speak here in this key panel. And thank you to my old friends, uh, Yang Ahmad Mulia, Tunggu Zain al and uh, Ms. Tricia Yeo, of course. Good morning, everyone joining in this morning. Sorry I can't be there in person, health reasons, I'm afraid. If I should break into coughing bouts every now and then during my speech, well, uh, I apologize in, in, in advance. It's a fashion nowadays, I think, post-COVID, to cough every now and then. <laughs> now, in discussing the post-pandemic world and what we have learned about ourselves from it, we should, of course, not limit the horizons of our thinking to COVID-19 alone. Instead, it is more a soul-searching expedition that we set out upon today. COVID-19 is a very serious crisis. And like all good crises, COVID-19 mirrors us as we really are. The makeup is washed away and the political noise is relatively muted. A health pandemic hits society as a whole and therefore the lessons to be learned from it are many. More specifically, it tells us things about how society is organized or unorganized, about whether or not it is managed with resilience in mind in recognition of the unexpected and the unpredictable, and to what extent our system of governance is just an ad hoc structure in reality. Now, Malaysia has never lacked people who study what is wrong and what is right. With it. In fact, it was long-term opposition to how Malaysian society was organized that led to the change in government in 2018. The COVID-19 has provided us with a more stripped down version of real reality to decipher. Now, some countries were already in a governance crisis before COVID, and I would place Malaysia among them. Well, in some ways, Malaysian politics survives on sustaining an unend unending sense of crisis in one way or another. But be that as it may, the COVID crisis did come exactly as this, at the same time as the country was already in a new self-generated political crisis. In many ways, the country being threatened by a new virus gave the new government that took power in February 2020 much breathing space. The elected Pakatan Harapan government from 2018 shocked, by, shocked both by its sudden demise and by the pandemic was not able to strategize its way back into power despite the hugely dubious manner in which it was toppled in early 2020. Over coming months, the excessive politicking that went on in Malaysia and that would continue throughout the next two years 
while humankind experienced one of the worst disasters in modern times, turned the political class in the country into a pariah breed. That public disgust with the old system ran and still runs deep. In that state of mind, the insight spread that the way Malaysia is organized is self-damaging, lackadaisical, and held captive by political games. As record floods hit the country at the end of 2021, the sorry lack of state capacity and competence became fully undeniable and even more painful. Even those who represent the status quo now talk about quote unquote, new narratives. From there, I would therefore say that most of us would agree that policy making in Malaysia has to change in fundamental ways. First of all, the narrative power of the political class needs to be curbed. The federal administration needs to become much more technocratic with political considerations pushed down to a minimum. And those opposing technocratic influence in the government's administration may not, may not be just the bureaucrats, it is more importantly the power holders. The symbiosis between a highly bureaucratized civil service and the overrated political class needs to be broken. That symbiosis is not only present in the daily workings between these two, but also in how politicians get voted in. Now, with all likelihood, the sidelining of technocrats in Malaysia's administration started with the privatization drive of the Mahatma years and the resultant de-technocratization of governance. Now, how does one reverse this process? That is the main question I wish to raise today. It is not rocket science, but it requires a lot of political struggle and debate. And not only from politicians, but among voters and among opinion makers like think tankers. The process, I think, is theoretically simple in itself. You train technocrats, you employ technocrats, you enhance technocratic processes and procedures in governance again, and you balance them against the position of bureaucrats and politicians. How to get that done is what we have to discuss in the near future. Seen from another angle, the subduing of academics and journalists since the 1970s allowed for politicizing and polarizing discourses to dominate Malaysian minds. Malaysian society as a whole is still paying the cost of this decades long control over social thought, broken today only because of the internet. Policy making based on research and reliable data is not really possible unless you have technocrats strongly embedded and influential in the civil service again, who can appreciate the technicalities needed for proper and long-term policy thinking and policy making. Instead of developing the nation, we should first and foremost develop the state. Since we are talking about the Federation of Malaysia, building the state boils down in rea reality to the developing of federalism, something sadly ignored over the last few decades in favor of central control. So across the board, for policy making to be rational, competent and transparent, Malaysia needs to develop the federal apparatus towards administrative efficacy. There are many, there are very fundamental reasons for why Malaysia was born a federation. It is in fact a federation upon a federation. Making full use of that inherited structure, maximizing efficacy in that federal structure should be a major political, a major policy consideration going forward. Social harmony and re resilience and economic and political stability depend on the country finding a balance that suits Malaysia's very diverse conditions. Now, another interesting new political trend moving in sync with what I'm saying is the holding of state elections separate from the federal elections. What this will mean is that state concerns and state level politics along with state voters more parochial or local sentiments will be receiving more space in political discourse and will not be as badly overshadowed as before by federal politics and federal centric excuses. I believe also that real change is generational and with only 18 things will change. We just need to make sure that it, sorry, we just need to make sure that it happens in the right way. 
I shall end by asking again, how do we reverse the sidelining of technocracy and meritocracy? And how do we inject technocratic competence into a corrupting system deeply based on political patronage and racial emotions and concerns? That is a major issue for think tank to think about for policy thinking post pandemic. I, shall, I think I shall end here and give the space to my fellow panelists. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you, Dato. Very timely. Ten minutes in precise. Um, exactly, actually, it's ten minutes in precise when we do the counting. Um, but more than that, I think uh, Dato, Doctor, has mentioned a very important points and the need of having new narratives on this fight over highly bureaucratic government dealing with federalism as well as political patronage. Good points. We'll take time to decipher that later. Now, um, going on to the next speaker, please allow me to welcome um, Encik Shavil Sabaruddin, Senior Fellow of Bayt Al Amana. Over to you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, uh, first of all, I would like to express uh, the depth of gratitude that um, ideas have given to Bayt Alamana to participate in this discussion. And of course, I would like to also take this opportunity to uh, express the sincerest of apologies uh, on behalf of Professor Dr. Abdul Azak, who was looking so forward to join, but uh, um, apparently because of his health concerns, he can't make it even virtually. Anyway, uh, to expound a bit on what uh, Datuk Dr. Oi has so um, articulated very well, uh, on things like uh, us, our, our, our fight or our whole uh, quest of soul searching should not be limited just to COVID-19. In fact, actually, when we talk about reimagining think tanks, we are looking at something a bit more larger and beyond it. We are experiencing now a great uh, realignment in policymaking, especially in this uh, post-pandemic world. So as all this governments, businesses, and also the general public start to evolve, they start to adapt to the new normal, which we think in the end shouldn't be treated as a new normal, but business as usual in the future. We should not miss the boats of reforms that need it, and these fall under perhaps three imperatives. Um, one is we need to imagine a new future together. Uh, second, we need to be fearless to challenge the status quo. Like we, the, the main objective and the main questions that's been outlined by Dr. Khairil, um, that we need to be able to now explore and explicate the questions, uh, that is the sensitive questions uh, in Malaysia. And also then to the third part, which is where we need to be bold enough to embrace change. So perhaps this is where our whole function as the, 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 the brain trust of the country is imperative. So today I would like to outline perhaps three key changes in which us think tanks should embrace in the new era of policymaking specific to this. First, we need to have constructive engagement with government. And this is not um, rhetorical. This means that we really need to understand the depth and breadth of government. And I believe every think tank has the same kind of thinking and has been doing the same kind of stuff. Like ideas has already had their own uh, bout of experience doing uh, policy making hand in hand with government. But still, this is still centered to discussion because we understand that the era of government knows best is certainly over. It's certainly over. That's there's no question about it. And the trends and the change of society that happens because of COVID and the other disruptions have actually forced government to try to move together with it, but we know that there's a lack of it. So now as such, think tanks needs to step in to constructively engage with the government to improve our policy making process. We cannot no longer work in silos. There's, I, I don't have the number, but I, I'm sure that we have more than 25 think tanks working on achieving one specific objective at the same time. So perhaps we need to then have a deeper understanding of how the government, the civil service, the government machinery, the agencies, and every other government apparatus thinks the sophistication of the system and also the limitations that they face. This also involves the intricacies of the way that the government operates. For example, a very simple thing, limitations such as political will. Just now, Dr. Dr. also mentioned this, political will and how center is, how do we then break down that whole political um, class 
in the civil service? How do we then break that one down or at least work together with it hand in hand so that we can then uh, improve that particular limitation in terms of political will? And then fiscal capacity. Uh, when we talk about disruption, disruption means that there's perhaps a, a, a realignment or a, a revamp or reinvention in terms of fiscal approach. And then implementation challenges. We're talking about the involvement of that, what, what the doctor mentioned just now, the involvement of technocrat as a center of government. That means that we need to have real, new, uh, innovative approach to implementation uh, changes. But also the limitations outside of all of this, the confluence or the pressure that comes internally and externally from public, from lobbyists, from businesses, or even radical or ideological groups. These are true. And um, of course, then we cannot not afford to actively engage uh, government in the best way possible. Instead of, you know, I'm not trying to uh, preach to the choir, but instead of what, what we see right now, a lot of civil society organizations join the chorus of just dismissive comments or highlighting government inefficiencies and also ineffectiveness. So think tanks, we should reconsider idealistic policies. Of course, we have the propensity then to kind of like take what, what not cherry pick, but then understand that there are things that could be better in a lot of ways, but the reality when it sets in, it means that sometimes we need to tone down or mellow down our realistic or idealistic um, expectations in terms of policy developments because we need to then understand the intricacies and the difficulties of government operatives to implement and in addition we should then try to synthesize all of the information that we have and research that we have in the most um, uh, in the most innovative way to adapt into the government structure of the day all in all we need to have a collaborative engagement model. This also means that the government, the society, the businesses, even the, the uh, environmental concerns need to work together as a collaborative uh, quadruple helix model. Second, incorporating international perspectives. Now, what happens in one corner of the globe directly or indirectly affects all of us. For instance, the Wuhan virus, sorry, the COVID-19 virus, which originated at, uh, at Wuhan early, no, at, December 2019. The spread of it with all of these confirmed cases made our dis disrupted the entire business process of the entire world. And the return of the Taliban, its polarizing impact on Malaysian citizens across the political spectrum and re uh, religious ideology is also something that directly or indirectly influences all of us. So we need to then incorporate an international perspective into our policymaking as think tanks. And we should live global dimensions to public policy instead of proposing policy recommendation in isolation. Of course, we have that particular propensity because perhaps our perspective is a bit narrowed down, but uh, we need to then uh, internationalize our view. International events and future happenings are sure to impact the policies in which we propose. For example, consider the current Russian invasion of Ukraine. How will this then affect policies and policy making in Malaysia? How will the rise in oil and energy prices then affect our economic recovery? Uh, what can we do then to preserve food security uh, as commodity prices rise? How can Malaysia then address the expected rise in domestic and imported inflation? And will the war that we're seeing right now dampen Malaysia's nascent export-led recovery besides exacerbating uh, global supply uh, chain disruptions? And how will sanctions imposed affect defense procurements from Russia? Considering all this, what should Malaysia's di diplomatic responses be? So to address the need for international perspectives in policy making, we need greater international collaboration between all of our think tanks to deal with global and national crisis. This aligns with, of course, our UN uh, SDG Goal 17 to strengthen the means of implementation and revitalize the global partnership for sustainable development. So that's second. Number three, finally, active advocate of great ideas. Now, as we imagine our think tanks, we need to actively advocate our research findings to the general public. So, um, of course, we've been doing it. It's just uh, I'm reiterating what we uh, what we have said so, just so that we confirm uh, our original bias. Beyond research work, uh, as think tanks do, we should proactively champion great ideas and raise awareness towards greater public support. So, I implore, I mean, on behalf of Bait Alamana, I implore all of us to operate less like a research university, less like an ivory tower, which focuses on producing academic article journals with minimal reach and lacking in impact on society at large. We cannot not afford to have. An uh, we have uh, we have a, a relationship with the public. We can't just shrug and say that they're not our target audience. We can't escape the current reality. You now the public are now a key player in our national discourse. 
So the government is more likely to support ideas already that, that have public support. So it's an easier way for us to build and maintain pop, um, um, pop momentum or popularity in um, uh, the, the, the research work that we already do. So also we need to, uh, we need to um, you know, be careful uh, lest we drown in uh, the syndrome of our tower so that we don't lose touch with the core issues on the ground. This has also been articulated just now by uh, Dr. Oi. Also, we need to be prompt in our response to both national and global issues. Instead of waiting for endless cycles of peer reviews that might result in our irrelevant to uh, policy making. So one way that perhaps we can improve advocacy is by engaging with political circles and work together to disseminate research findings and communicate excellent ideas to the public. For example, our work together in SEEDS that has been championed by political masters and they've been deliberated and articulated in parliament that we put into the main frame of political discourse. So that is, needs to be enhanced a lot more. And one important example is the advocacy that we uh, done to propose mechanisms against all of this party hopping, um, this, um, the other reforms and, and, and all of this have now been born some of the fruit, especially what we see in Johor state elections, where every manifesto talks about this specific political reform that we have been pushing all the while. So um, just to try to conclude, of course, we think tanks alone cannot change the larger culture and society force without the necessary advocacy effort needs. This is uh, a work of the larger society. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shahril, um, for the thoughts. Um, there are various points that you have raised, um, and you are also echoing from, from the points of uh, Dr. Dr. Oi uh, just now. And I see there are new points, but again, let's just gather all of these points together and perspectives together, and we'll decipher it in the reflection and discussions later. Uh, with that, uh, let's welcome our third speaker on the stage, the CEO of the Centre, uh, Dr. Kairil Izamin Ahmad. Over to you, Doctor. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Zohri. Uh, thank you also to Ideas uh, for inviting uh, the Centre and me to this um, conference. Uh, I personally, in both professional and uh, personal capacities, uh, have a long history with uh, ideas and its staff, Trisha included. Um, and I'm very happy to be back amongst old friends. Uh, thank you also to Dato Dr. Ui uh, and also Mr. Sharil for <coughs> the enlightening um, um, presentations. Um, Compared to many other think tanks uh, in the country, uh, the centre is relatively young. I don't know myself how many we have, uh, as Mr. Sharil has mentioned, but we're definitely young. And we are also, for the majority of our existence, uh, have been um, operating in pandemic conditions. We opened our doors um, in late 2019, then the pandemic hit and we've had to adapt to these new conditions. And research focus um, have had to be um, aligned. Uh, if they were ongoing, then they had to be realigned with um, um, the demands that have come with um, the pandemic um, of COVID-19. But in any case, um, the reason why we were set up was because there was this recognition that um, Malaysia had arrived at a significant juncture of its history um, as a result, of course, of G14, as Dato Dr. Ui has mentioned earlier, and a recognition that there was now an opportunity for more voices to help shape the future of the country and contribute to the change that was coming. But of course, a lot of things happened along the way, as highlighted as well earlier, change of government. Um, but one thing, that, one thing is for sure, the floodgates were already open, uh, and uh, here we are uh, in this kind of discourses discussing ways to challenge the status quo, as mentioned by Mr. Sharil, discussing ways uh, to enhance the role of think tanks in policy making. I myself personally made the move from the ivory tower a year ago um, to this world of the think tank, uh, or the world of think tanking. Um, uh, it, it's different, but there's a lot of potential uh, in terms of how uh, we can shape um, societal discourses. So, um, of course, Primarily, we have this objective of upstreaming our um, ideas to try to influence policy making. But uh, at the centre, we also we're also constantly thinking how those ideas can be 
shared uh, in ways that are um, accessible to the rakyat, um, the public, because um, we believe that uh, there's a need for us to expand the resources for debates in um, for, for public policy debates. We'd like more and more people to participate in this debate. So when we um, sit down and discuss how exactly we'd like to um, publish, put forward our research, there's always these two dimensions. We think about how we'd approach um, people in um, authority, but we also think about how uh, we'd like pe people on the ground to understand where we're coming from uh, and participate uh, in the discussion that we'd like to um, initiate. So to answer Dr. Zohri's questions, uh, I would put forward um, two of what I think are the most important um, roles that uh, think tanks should play in Malaysia uh, in facing up the challenges that um, that are um, brought about by the pandemic. Yeah. The first one would be, uh, and this relates to what I've just said earlier about connecting with um, the mass audience, the rakyat, the public, the general public, uh, is that we should be the agent to help democratize the generation of ideas in society. So we need as many people as possible to participate in policy debates, but we should also recognize that there's a dearth of accessible information that's available as resources for people to draw upon if they're interested to participate in these debates. Um, therefore, we should play a role in disseminating such information and knowledge to foster healthy and open discussions. And this is something that, um, um, if I could just elevate this a little bit to a more academic level, uh, this is something that differentiates think tanks with universities. And this is also, there's, there's this, this very famous definition of a think tank, it's a university without students. Um, knowledge production nowadays is no longer something that takes place uh, within the realm of the ivory tower or the university uh, or uh, academic institutions. Uh, it also happens in our sort of realm. And we have a greater reach um, because of the way we try to communicate um, our ideas. So this is something that we are already doing, of course, but it can also be something that we should try to be always conscious about. Uh, and this would be um, this would, would be shown in the way that we communicate our um, ideas uh, for change, the way we communicate our policy solutions for the issues that we're trying to tackle. So I'd like to think that there's an educational quality to the work that we do as think tankers. Uh, even if we agree that ultimately we'd like to influence the policy process, we want to upstream these ideas, but we should also democratize the process of the generation of these ideas. Because, as Dr. Zohri has mentioned in, in, in his uh, introduction, we, there is a need to include as many people as possible in the conversation. And there's a need for us to also to try to understand, to collate, to synthesize, and to aggregate what people actually want. Uh, but that, of course, does not discount the fact that we, have also, we also have to take a critical view uh, when we get all this uh, information. Um, so that's... Um, the first thing, um, my first answer as to what uh, think tanks should do. And in the center, what we have tried, just to give some examples, uh, is that um, in our editorial process, for example, before we put out uh, publications, um, there is a lot of thought that's put into how exactly we'd like to articulate our arguments. Is this too academic? It's something that I've had to curb myself when I joined as a former academic. Um, but it's something that I think um, is a really fruitful exercise. We try to, or we always um, append um, visuals, for example, in our publications, cartoons, illustrations, um, glossy graphs and charts, uh, because we think that um, uh, this is something that would be appealing to the mass audience. Um, so it's not just about appealing or getting policymakers to read, but it's also about getting um, people who are out there to understand where we're coming from and hopefully to buy into the kind of stuff that we are trying to propose. Uh, we've also got a unique social media presence. 
Um, we produce spin-off uh, content from our research um, uh, for public consumption, uh, videos, um, graphics, flip books, um, and, and so on. So these are the kind of stuff that we try to do in order to try to democratize the process uh, of um, idea generation. Um, and it's something that um, is something that would allow you to also understand um, what's happening um, in the minds of people who are affected um, by uh, the issues that you're trying to cover. Uh, it also allows you to communicate um, your position on those issues. Uh, and then it becomes a process of, or a self-reflective process uh, as a think tank, trying to understand what people really want uh, in trying to articulate uh, our positions. Uh, and this then um, speaks to my second point, which is that uh, advocacy, um, the ideas that we articulate, um, the solutions that we come up with and propose should be workable um, in order for us to become enablers of, en enablers of change. I think this very much overlaps with what Mr. Sharon said earlier. Uh, maybe uh, idealistic ideas needs to be moderated a little bit uh, in order to make sure that um, people who would ultimately take decisions uh, would think, would believe that, oh, okay, this might work. Um, because, again, just to go back to Dr. Zofri's uh, introduction, if we accept that there are political realities that need to be observed, that certain sensitivities are rather visceral or primordial even uh, amongst the different groups in the society, we've got to think of solutions that would, of course, challenge those realities but they would also not alienate people. And this is something that we also, uh, at the center, um, are always constantly um, reflecting on or thinking about. So we need innovative solutions, uh, and at the same time, pragmatic ones when we articulate um, our ideas. Um, and I think uh, in, in, in the very short time that we've been around, we've shown that that's possible. Um, and we've sort of bucked the trend to some extent because um, we've eschewed um, the seduction of being ideological <laughs> to, to, to a large extent uh, in favour of more pragmatic solutions to ideas. Uh, and uh, in that sense, I think we've bucked the trend as well. So whenever there are discussions out there, for example, just, just, just to highlight uh, one of the um, discussions that we've, we've, we've had uh, recently about uh, employment um, uh, our Employment um, Act, um, rather than um, uh, take up um, uh, what would be a rather mainstream sort of call uh, in regards to formalizing certain segment of the working, uh, the workforce in the country, uh, people in the gig economy, for example, we've gone for a different sort of solution, something that's more innovative, uh, that of course, um, Again, um, to highlight what one of, what one of the um, speakers have said earlier, uh, is very much based upon our consideration of trends um, elsewhere. So there's always also this um, need to understand developments elsewhere and try to contextualize them uh, in, in Malaysia and see whether or not they can be learned from uh, when we are trying to articulate our um, um, positions. Um, thank you very much. Uh, that's it for now, but we can uh, have more discussions after this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kyrin Izamin. Um, two points. Um, democratizations of ideas, as well as uh, advocating for a workable solutions. Now, with that, I'd like to call upon the last uh, speaker on the stage, uh, Trisha Yeo from Ideas. Thank you so much, Dr. Zokri. A very good morning to Tunku Zain, our founding president and chairman, my fellow panelists, Dr. Kairil Izamin Ahmad, Dato Dr. Uyi Kibeng, Insheik Shahril, who I've not met in person, and uh, all the members of the audience, our beloved ideas staff here who are here with us today, um, as well as to all the audience out there. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I have three sections to my 10 minute intervention and I hope that I am able to cover everything. Uh, the first 
I'm going to talk about the future of policy making, which is the title of the topic today. The second is what the role of a think tank is, and this very much comes about from my own thoughts and my own um, beliefs and how we've tried to shape ideas as a think tank. And finally, some immediate changes that I think are not only inevitable, but what we try to do as a think tank to push forward these transformations as well. Um, and if my voice sounds a little bit nasal, it's because I've just recovered from COVID. Uh, but I'm beyond the infectious stage, so don't worry, those who are sitting beside me. Um, I, I really enjoyed listening to all three of my fellow panelists' um, interventions about what the future of policy making and the role that think tanks can play. Um, absolutely agree with everything that, that they have shared. Um, the first thing I want to say is that, indeed, you know, where, where we are now is, is, in the last two years, we all have said that the pandemic has accelerated and deepened existing trends. And I think um, this is certainly true. Policy making of the past was a very traditionally static process. Um, and we know that over the last two years with the pandemic, um, with the flood, and you know, the, all the, the debates that have been taking place as a result of these two national crises, including uh, the debates over whether EPF should be used as a source of, of income, um, including you know, environmental issues. The trends right now are on you know, economics, uh, social and governance, ESG. Um, everything that happened in politics as well over the last two years, the suspension of parliament, and the role that think tanks like ours played in contributing to that discourse, all this shows you that policy making can no longer take place in a vacuum. Uh, one of our pri previous prime ministers did say, which uh, Sharil actually said, uh, that government doesn't know best anymore. We have said this, we have articulated this, but I think that governments around the world, including ours, are still are still operating in that rather static mode. So it's one thing to say that governments don't know best, but I think in reality, um, the civil service, the institutions are still operating in a very traditional manner, uh, precisely because they have not been shown methods of how a new kind of policy making process can take place. So they fall back to the default mode. They fall back to the default mode of um, you know, making sure that policies are done in a very in-house manner, um, consulting with those who they have traditionally consulted. Um, so government itself is not used to working or meaningfully incorporating long-term stakeholder relationships within the policy-making process. But I've had the privilege of, you know, being in other environments around the world, and there are great, great examples of how governments have adopted processes such as uh, what's called the Open Government uh, Partnership, the OGP. Um, countries like Georgia, uh, Indonesia, and the Philippines in the region are really good examples where multiple stakeholders came together to co-craft policy. I have attended conferences and been in rooms where both the governments represented by either ministers or the civil servants themselves are speaking with civil society and think tanks as to how they can craft future plans, long-term annual plans on how transparency and accountability can be the order of the day. So it is really not impossible. Um, good practices have been made examples of around the world. So that's uh, kind of the first section. Uh, my main point there is that, that policy making cannot take place in a vacuum any longer. But what does that really mean in reality? And, and is our government at the federal or state or even local governments, are they prepared for the reality of what that means? It's one thing to say it, but how are they actually going to practice it? Are they prepared for the challenges uh, and the often very difficult conversations, right, that are going to be had? when you actually open yourself up. When you open yourself up to discussion, you receive criticisms as well. It's a very difficult thing to manage. Um, are we prepared for that? Okay. Um, so my second main point, the second section, is the role of a think tank. Now let's really think about it, right? Think tanks, 
originated in the 20th century. The concept of a think tank itself is a very archaic, um, traditional one. The fact that think tanks still survive today, I think, uh, is a testament to our own resilience and our own will. Um, but think tanks have, have been around for a long time. And in the past, think tanks were very conservative in the sense that they actually directly are linked to a political party or they are linked to a government of the day. So think tanks worked in order to shape the policy, the ideology, the speech making, the policy making process of a particular government. But we are in the 21st century today. I think there really needs to be um, an articulation of what think tanks can do differently. And I think some of those that are here with us today are really setting great examples of how think tanks can be different. What does a think tank of a 21st century look like? Um, last year, I, I attended uh, an international conference. Obviously, it was virtual because of the pandemic. And it's called On Think Tanks. It's, uh, it's a really great conference to attend if any of you are think tankers out there. And the keynote address was delivered by a lady called Anne-Marie Slaughter. Um, she's quite a well-known personality because of her role in the White House previously. And I really like what she said um, because I believe what she said also forms the foundations of how I think a think tank should operate and also I think how Ideas has been uh, over the last uh, one year plus that I've came back. So I'm just going to summarize a couple of things because I think these are really relevant for us to think about. Um, there are seven main points here, very short, don't worry, and I'll give examples as well. So number one, we should see ourselves as public problem-solving organizations in which policy is an important piece, but only one piece, right? Um, what are we looking at? What are we really trying to address? We are trying to address problems in society. Uh, these can come in the form of policies, but these can also come in, in all kinds of other forms. When we talk about parliament, for example, are we really talking about policy? Um, no, we're talking about, um, you know, uh, uh, how are we going to change standing orders of parliament to, en to enable more number of days of debate in parliament. That's not necessarily policy per se. Um, so policy is an important piece, but only one piece. We're looking, ourselves, we're looking at ourselves as public problem-solving organizations. Number two, ideas really matter. So we belong in think tanks because, you know, ultimately, what are we doing? We are articulating ideas. So ideas really matter. We have a really strong belief that ideas do matter. But more than that, ideas drive action, right? So we are people who believe deeply in words, research, evidence, ideas matter. We, put, we pour so much of our time and our energies into writing papers because we believe that the ideas translated into research, into evidence, these can make a difference. Number three, we are think tanks or thinkers more wedded to action than academia. So I think that's a very interesting trend here. All of my previous speakers um, have also shared that we are more than ivory towers, right? But ideas are not enough. A push to action and thought. So think tanks, and of course, there's an array of different think tanks. Some are more academic than others. Some are more, perhaps, ivory tower than others. But I think for think tanks in the 21st century to really work well, we have to push ourselves to do both um, intellectual content as well as pushing that towards action. Number four, and I think this is uh, something that we still struggle with, honestly, as a think tank at Ideas. So to develop new ways of thinking is to start with the subjects of the policy, to talk to them about what they need. Um, a lot of times, we, we do start with ideas because we believe there are better ways of doing things. Um, but what we've really tried to do over the last year is to talk to the subjects whom we are studying. So if we are talking about Orang Asli, if we are talking about refugee communities, we talk to the subjects. Um, if we want to talk about poverty, eradication, if we want to talk about uh, indigenous people, uh, we want to talk about you know, regional imbalance and the developmental imbalance in Sabah and Sarawak, it's important to really speak to the subjects of the policy. Number five, and this is something I'm very proud of at Ideas, making use of technology and civic tech, which is the way of thinking that is ground up and experimental. 
Over the last year, Ideas has launched at least five new different um, online platforms, uh, civic tech platforms, that have allowed us to showcase policy in very visual forms, uh, one of which that uh, I think you know, the team was really proud of was pantalkwasa.com. Uh, you can check it out online if, you are, uh, if, you're, if you're on your laptops. It's a visual visualization of political appointments on the boards of um, government-linked companies, specifically the federal statutory bodies. And it shows you the political appointments in the boards uh, over the last three administrations, from the Najib administration to the Mahathir administration, and then finally to the Mohidin one. Uh, we haven't yet done the current administration, but we're going to get there. <laughs> we're going to get there. Um, but, but the point is this, right? Technology is at our fingertips and we can use it. We can use it to menyampaikan message kepada masyarakat. We can use technology to ensure that the people out there are receiving, are on the receiving end um, of the data that we're trying to, to push forward. Um, coming, there, coming there to the end of the list, um, number six, data is experimental. We recognize that data enables feedback. So again, data is not static. And finally, think tanks as civic enterprises that em emphasize coalition building. Um, again, I, I really believe this is important. Coalition building is when we can reach across the different divides. And Malaysia has many of these divides. We understand that Malaysia has uh, various um, chasms, various groups that are divided. But how do we reach across this divide is to build coalitions. And Ideas has really tried to do this over the last year. Uh, we've been engaging with different members of civil society, different think tanks as well, to, to build those coalitions. So um, my, final, my final section, and I'm not sure how much time I have, um, is to just talk about what I think are some inevitable changes, right? If you talk about policy making, yes, we have an ideal. Um, we may not be able to achieve that ideal, but I think these are some inevitable changes that are, are happening now as we speak, and uh, we should really embrace these changes as ways that think tanks can also play a role in being part of the process. So number one, I think, is the transformation of public service. So meaning that governments themselves are going to change regardless of, you know, even if we, we say that it's archaic and old and you know, traditional. They have to change because of tech, because of my digital blueprint, right? Um, like it or not, the civil servants will have to transform the way they think. And we can be there to help them. Um, number two, decentralization of decision making. We know that Malaysia is a highly centralized country, even though we are a federation. Uh, Dr. Ui pointed that out. But no matter what, Look at the pandemic. Um, even if Malaysia is a centralized country, the state governments have already acted with local NGOs to make sure that uh, some of the, the problems, for example, um, communities that were not given enough food, they are already working hand in hand. So decentralization is something that will already happen, and I hope to see greater trends in that. And finally, multi-stakeholder um, accountability. So we need to push for multi-stakeholder accountability where think tanks can be at that forefront. And I really hope that think tanks can be seen as a reliable uh, partner um, that can work hand in hand with government to ensure that they can receive the transparency and accountability for more participative decision-making processes. So that's all for now, and I look forward to engaging further. Thank you. Thank you, Trisha. <clears throat> You've highlighted on what is it to expect in the future, and what are actually our roles to play because of the expectation of the future, as well as the challenges that we are facing right now. Thank you to all panelists and speakers for giving Give, uh, giving their thoughts and perspective and, and regarding what they do at their personal uh, organizations. Um, right now is the reflection and discussion sessions. 
in which we will corroborate and discuss and reflect all of the points that will be made by our speakers. Uh, that will possibly take about five to ten minutes, and then we will straightly open the floor for any questions. Again, um, to all our viewers and listeners out there, either that you are in Zoom, on Facebook, uh, please write your questions, your comments and opinions at the chat box there. We'll address these questions immediately, uh, independent uh, on the number of questions that we received. Now, I've just also been informed uh, by our tech person that at the moment we have 86 uh, viewers who are listening and joining us online. Uh, thank you for joining us online and we, we hope that you'll stay throughout the discussion as well as throughout the conference throughout the day. So let me just go through on to the points. Now, I think from Dato Doctor all until Trisha, everyone ha has stated all their perspectives, right? Uh, this is what we should do. And I think this perspective is because of what you see that Think Tank should, should, should react. All right, uh, but the, the question is, and I think let's just start the discussion, Dato Doctor and Jay Sharil, is that what are the converging points that we all can agree today on how Think Fang should move forward with the current context of Malaysia? All right, because I think there are some similar points that has been raised, but it's not been been corroborated well. For instance, I think uh, Dato Doctor mentioned about technocratics, uh, in which we have to let the technocrats to, to perhaps lead the nation as lead in the policy making. Um, Shavil said that government government knows best is over. Echoed by Trisha, and as well that uh, Dr. Kyrie also have mentioned that how that we advocate the solutions for, for the public. So I think something that is converging here and something that I think we, we, we must clear it out in this discussion today so that at least in Malaysia, think tanks are known to be united for one common agenda, despite that we work on various areas and policies that we do. But what is the main agenda that we want to show to our people out there that we are united on this uh, matter? Anyone? Anyone? Please feel free because it's, it's a yeah. reflection and discussion. Mm. May, I, may, I, may I start? Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I think I, I don't know what, what the other panelists feel, but my, my feeling after listening to all the all, all our panelists is that hey, this discussion would be so much more interesting if we had a small round table. You know, but that is the nature of what we want to talk about, really. It, it, and what is converging, of course, is that I think all of us feel that Malaysia can do better. I think all of us feel that. I think that there's this drive, right, in all of us. And if, if I continue by by Picking up on what Tricia mentioned about what think tanks are and all that, uh, and you know, although it's a, it's an old creation, we do feel that it's it's got a very important role to play going forward. Um, I think think tanks sort of fill a vacuum in Malaysia that all of us feel feel, and I think that vacuum, back to what a, a point I wanted to make, is that we have not given enough thought to the long term consequences of what happened from the 1970s onwards when uh, academia was controlled. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, students were not allowed to take part in politics and so forth and, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, the control over journalism. And if we think of those things happening for a few decades before the internet came and tried to break that, largely thanks to the first case being Malaysia Kini, of course. Uh, so for 30 years or so, um, when the public space itself was, was subdued, what it meant was that the main voice that could speak out was the political voice. And I think that has led to, to that has affected Malaysian culture a lot. We, we can even see it in how journalists act today. Whatever a politician says is always more important than what something somebody else says, you know because they, maybe they're thinking back about, of, about what their own editor is going to, to spike or, or to publish and so on and so forth. So I think there's a vacuum that we, we, we feel that we, we have to fill. And I think that's why there are so many think tanks in Malaysia and all, all very vibrant ones, if I may add. Uh, and you can imagine if we could work together and get some synergy going, we can really change the discourse and, and deepen 
the nature of public discourses in, in, in Malaysia. So I think think tanks are extremely important uh, going forward. Thank you. I, I like it when you say that Malaysia can be better, but at the same time, we have the gaps. And I think this is where that we, we fill up the gaps, right? What, what do other panelists think uh, about that? Because I think it's a very strong message. Because in this session, we want to actually uh, tell our readers uh, what is the message that we want to, to, to actually air out uh, in the sessions today. Uh, perhaps Doctor uh, or Trisha, uh, anyone else? Feel free to jump in, yeah? This is no in order and so. Trisha, let me go first, uh, kindly. Uh, so I, I, I would now um, hijack uh, Maxim that ideas would definitely approve of. <laughs> Free market of ideas. <laughs> um, you see, we're all friends, right? Uh, think tanks, it's a small world. We don't know how many there are, yes, but we know each other, we speak, we meet up. Um, we care for the country. We want the country to be better, as uh, Dr. Uwe has mentioned. But at the same time, um, we also recognize that our solutions may not necessarily be aligned with one another. And we are actually competing for people's attention. We are competing for people's buy-ins. Uh, and that's, that's basically what a democratic process is. But it doesn't mean that we cannot converge on issues uh, that really matter. And this is something that um, does happen if it's not um, public, it happens behind the scenes. We talk about collaborating in research, for example. Uh, we sign up to um, initiatives or petitions uh, that we feel are aligned with our um, beliefs and approaches and principles. Uh, and this is uh, what I think Trisha mentioned as well earlier. This is what coalition building is about. Um, and it's not just, you know, like Dr. Wei mentioned about roundtable, right? It's also perhaps good if we could also diversify this sort of discussion to include um, institutes or think tanks that would diverge quite radically from the kind of progressive, liberal, whatever kind of change that um, um, something things like us actually want. Then we can see where the divergences are as well, because we are talking about uh, a plurality of approaches. Uh, we are talking about a diversity of um, aims and objectives, uh, and it's inevitable and policy making process is a political process. It's something that we cannot avoid. Uh, there, there will be moments when um, uh, we will deeply disagree with one another, but there are also issues um, where we can collaborate on. Uh, but what's most important is to have forums like this where, where we sit down and have conversations, no matter where we stand, um, ideologically or in terms of values. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to add a couple of things. So um, one is that absolutely agree, uh, all of us want what's best for Malaysia. Um, the beauty of think tanks is that we actually have a little bit of, of space, of, of intellectual as well as political space actually, away from the political leaders away from the actual policy makers. And that space is really important. We value that space. We value that space because it gives us um, the independence of thought, of critical thinking. And it also allows us a bit of like, hey, you know, we love the country, we love, um, we want the best for the country, but we don't agree with what's happening. And we think there are better ways of doing it. So um, this is why actually it's really important for, for us at least at Ideas, to really emphasize our independence, um, that we're not you know, affiliated to any particular uh, political party and so on. I mean, not, not to say that if you are, that means that you're not independent, but that is something that we really strive towards, especially um, independence of our editorial work as well. So that kind of intellectual space, I think, is really important for us to preserve and, and strongly fight for. So that's something that we always strongly fight for. Um, so about those who disagree with us, I think this is, this is a really important point to discuss. Um, I think while we're all competing in this free market of ideas, thank you, Kyril, for raising that. Um, and, and, and most of us, I think, in this room would largely subscribe to similar things, right? We want a we wanna democracy uh, founded on the constitution. We believe in the parliament. Um, but 
let's admit it that there are groups out there who don't necessarily want this sort of liberal democracy, democracy for the country. Uh, what do we do then? I think that's a very important point for us to you know, come face to face squarely with. Um, I would say that at Ideas, we have strived very hard as well to reach out to other groups who don't agree with us. Um, last, the last two years, we had a very big project on national unity um, and interracial harmony. Um, in which we did broach very sensitive topics, right? We talked about the NEP, we talked about um, whether liberal values uh, disrupt traditional values, and we even talked about ICERT, which, as we know, was a source of great controversy um, at the end of 2018, right? 2018. Um, and we, we actually talked to some groups as well with whom we disagreed. Uh, I won't say that, you know, you can change minds completely overnight. But what's really important is for us to have a conversation together and to accept that it is possible to come together in a rational space and have conversations that are based on reason. I think one thing that's really missing in our national discourse is that a lot of times the, the, the discussions just go way out of reason, so beyond reason. And I think that's frustrating to, to intellectual communities. Here we are trying to engage on factual discourse, but uh, many times, I mean, including in parliament, right? Yeah. The, the discourse actually goes way beyond reason. And how do we bring back reason into conversation? So I think that's something we must really fight for. Right. Um, wh what about your thoughts, Shahril? Um, just if I could add, um, you see, we, we, we have done a lot of academic research that has uh, explored on uh, or explicated things that are actually very topical and very interesting and things that if let's say we left, leave it to the public the public would actually if if it's done sexy enough they will they will really you know get absorbed to it and it could become topical but like what dr dr oi mentioned just now um we, political masters drives conversations you know like uh, if it's if it's very controversial, then that that happens. And right now, when we see on the digital space, uh, not just it has to do with politics, but even um, you know like fake news or news portals driving conversations that are very like uh, pushing the envelopes further to uh, things that are very sensitive. Those are what's topical. But uh, just latching onto this also, uh, our ideas could also fill that space if let's say we understand the keywords or understand the trends of what people are actually looking at and then fit our narrative into that overall discussion. Uh, so these exist tools of this like are there. Digital marketing cannot just be treated as just a marketing aspect or something that is very commercially driven. It could also help assist our positioning or how we would like to drive our conversation to our uh, agenda. Uh, it's just, I think, perhaps this is my personal opinion and based on um, uh, our experience in Bait Alamanda, our gap is actually to make our topic center to the discussion. It's not just competing within anyone else, but trying to make people to start to make it topical and that discourse to make it uh, sustainable. So um, all of this, I think it requires a set of special skills that marries the art and also technology to enable us to uh, have it happening in a digital space. That's my point. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just, just very quickly, um, um, just on, on the point of um, uh, converging, um, you know, there are certain things that um, think tanks can easily agree upon. Like Trisha said, you know, there are certain um, processes at the higher level that we, we recognize need to improve, right? Um, but I can give an example of a successful uh, collaboration between uh, think tanks in Malaysia. Uh, we've, we've been calling for uh, data transparency uh, for a long time, right? Uh, and we, we've seen a lot of movement uh, in this direction uh, in the past uh, year or so. As a result of the pandemic, of course, right? But we also amplified this, this demand. And this is something that we can sit together and agree upon because we need data to work. Right? <laughs> Without it, then it's, it's difficult. Lah. Every time I go and do interview only. Uh, so these are the kind of stuff that uh, uh, think tanks do work um, together on. Uh, and I, I'm just, just highlighting an example, lah, uh, a, a success story lah, of sorts.
because we are seeing more openness in terms of uh, data sharing uh, in, 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 in the government, uh, on, the, on the level of the government. We have, to, we have to credit the person behind your think tank as well for, for the data transparency. <laughs> Thanks, Kyril. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a proof of evidence that we do collaborate with one another for the greater good. All right, let's go on to the Q&A uh, sessions. Arif, how many questions have we gathered so far? Hello. Yes, we have a lot of questions. So the first question is directed to Dr. Karil Zamin Ahmad. Speaking of getting the people's attention, how does the conventional think tank operating through public forum compared to the speed of information dissemination, for example, by a blogger or alternative portal acting as a medium to circulate their agenda or propaganda? As more views are received at our fingertips, would think tanks mobilize such platforms to counter the different narratives? Um, I mean, the speed through which um, information is disseminated is um, ever increasing. Uh, it's something that I, I, I'm sure my colleagues here agree with as well. Uh, it's something that's always in the back of our minds, right? How, how quickly can we get to people before people actually consume things which... Um, uh, it's okay if things are different than what we want to say, but it's, it's, it's not okay if things are uh, based on uh, misinformation, for example. Uh, so there's not an easy answer to that, but I think I would echo one of the themes of the discussion today in that we should harness the power of technology as best as we can. And uh, this is something that we are trying to do as well in the center. We recently launched, we've had a long running research on hate speech, um, and we, we've been calling for a lot of changes in the way um, hate speech is managed in the country. But we've also been working in the past year or so, been working, we've been looking into projects uh, that could support the kind of calls that we've been making. And we recently launched uh, an AI-enabled uh, hate speech tracker. Uh, we're very proud of it, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a prototype, so it's, it does very, uh, you know, it, it's still quite basic, it's quite limited, but we're, we're, we're hoping that we can expand this kind of initiatives. It's something that's always in the cyberspace. People who can access the internet um, can always uh, go to it. We've, we've also prepared um, a place where they can, they can train the AI with um, you know, ever new pronouncements or ever new sort of um, words lah that, that are potentially hateful. Um, but these are the kind of small contributions we can make to try to counter um, the kind of um, trends that may be harmful uh, in public. But speed-wise, it's very difficult. There's not an easy answer to that. Um, you know, think tanks have quite a... You know, we, we have to go through internal QC, for example. We cannot just publish anything. And that alone already you know, um, makes you a bit slower than, for example, say bloggers will just put up things on the spot. Um, and people who are on um, um, all sorts of different blogging sites nowadays, for example, and of course social media, right? Uh, that's, that's the main platform of uh, dissemination. And there you're competing for attention. Uh, you're hoping the algorithm will <laughs> be as quick uh, to disseminate what you want to say, right? But um, no easy answer to that. But Harnessing technology is, I think, important for all things thanks to, to look into. Okay, thank you. The second question is, the second question is um, Mr. Sharil Sabaruddin, speaking about embracing change and the new future together, science and technology has progressed far from what it was used to be back then. And we realize how important they are in our daily life and in the decision-making process, especially in the time of a pandemic. So how can policymakers incorporate those two into the process of policymaking? Actually, if you look at what uh, like ideas and the point that has been doing, that's really a set in the right direction. Because just echoing what uh, Dr. Haider mentioned just now, um, we have to harness the use of technology and that's where the conversation is, that's where the attention is. 
that's where people are actually at, uh, getting all this information and this COVID has actually accelerated digital adoption, not just in the urban spaces, but also in the rural areas. So uh, it's rather straightforward for us to, um, um, to, to take that step, uh, to, to, to make sure that we can harness, we have to take that first step. And um, well, uh, I had a brief stint with ideas, perhaps with one uh, upcoming um, project, uh, I didn't manage to finish yet, but uh, that really was um, something that for me personally, I think, could have could have actually set uh, a different kind of uh, approach to um, public communication, especially in the digital uh, ecosystem. And of course, uh, it, the bug doesn't stop there. It's not just being social, uh, not just doing social, but being social. Being social means that basically we need to grow the conversation in the cybersphere by essentially tinkering with all of the tools that are available so that this becomes much more visible in terms of its reach and then creates the right engagement. So um, rather straightforwardly, I think the answer is just echoes what uh, Dr. Ferry has kind of articulated now. It seems more work for think tankers right now to understand the problem, to think about the solution, and to embrace the technology. So yeah, it makes the think tank works more sexier, I think, um, if that is the right impression to tell our audience. So what will be the next questions then, Arif? So the next question is directed to all of the panelists. So from the experience of all of the panelists, what are the key characteristics that differentiates policies that are implementable and not just theoretical to a certain extent? I like that question so much, right? The policy that we do, is it really relatable to the grassroots out there or is it more on theoretical basis? Anyone would like to start uh, in no chronological order? Yeah, I, I can if, if I may. You agree? Yes, yes. go on, Dato. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, that, that's, of course, a very important question. And I think I would start by connecting it to what uh, Dr. Kyril said earlier about the workable policies and workable suggestions and so on. Uh, I, I would start the discussion by, by saying that there are different there are ideas and there are ideas, right? There are ideas that are rather idealistic ideas, maybe taken from some model or some, something we read or something we have, we have seen other countries do, and then you try and then that's your ideal. And then you try to implement it under Malaysian conditions and so on. That, that's sort of the standard way of thinking about how, how an idea gets implemented uh, through a policy making process. But then I think most of the time, ideas don't function like that. Uh, many ideas come into being in a more anthropological fashion. So it, it's, it's, it's society that speaks to you as it were. Uh, so if for think tanks who work very closely with, with how governments work and all that, you, you would then approach ideas in a different way. The ideas sometimes come to you, you don't, it, you know, because of reality demands it in a way. And so ideas like that tend to be more workable because they, they're not coming down from on high. So there's a whole range of, of ideas really so on, on how things would work. And one, one last point where that is concerned is that I would like to say that a lot of think tank work, policy work, is not for public consumption in a way. Sometimes things get done because they are kept secret. Sometimes, you know, because of strategizing. A lot of ideas work because they, there's more strategizing involved than, than we tend to think, right? It's who to, who to give the idea to, in what form should the idea be given to that person and when should that happen and so on and so forth. So, um, so, so in my experience, sometimes uh, if, you, if the think tank decides not to take credit for something, it actually works better. You know, so that, that's something I'm sure all of all my colleagues would, would agree on. Certain things happen that way. So uh, there, are, there are think tanks I'm sure that are extremely efficient, but the public might not know about it. It's also part of that. that dark world of the think tank <laughs> I feel like um, while, while I have the floor may I may I point out one point I, that I would hate to have to be to see be forgotten and that's a point raised by Sharil uh, looking outwards I think he, he took out the point is that right I think one of the three points he said 
Now, I think that is that is an extremely important point. It's, sel it's seldom discussed, and it's not only about think tank work. It's about Malaysian consciousness generally. I think the the trouble with new nations, Malaysia being one of that, is that we tend to be very introverted, culturally introverted, and that that is sort of part of the point I wanted to make that we should be state building instead of nation building. When you're doing too much nation building, you're looking inwards. You're too concerned about who your neighbor is, what your neighbor does, what food your neighbor eats. Why does he do this? Why does she do that? You know, as, as if the world doesn't exist. Um, I think if, if we start think, placing ourselves in, in a more regional context, a global context, we would, see, we would see a shift in Malaysian consciousness itself. And I, for one, think that with, you know, with RCEP coming, I think that is, that is a good vehicle, really, for us to start thinking that we don't exist alone in the world. Our little problems, so well represented by our range of race-based political parties and whatnot, those are small problems. Those are small problems. The world is much bigger than, than the Klang Valley, I see what. Uh, so I, I, I just thought I, I should make sure that Shari's point does not get forgotten in all the other discussions that are raised. Thank you. So um, I'll try an answer to that question. Um, yeah, while thinking through the answer, I kind of like drew three circles, right? Your usual diagram and then like what are the factors that make it a workable solution, like what makes a workable policy solution workable. Um, so one circle I put was like the actual solution itself, right? The merit of the actual proposal or the actual recommendation. And then the other circle would be um, actually having a champion in government. Um, that's really, really crucial. So even if you have the best policy recommendation out there, if you don't have somebody championing for it, uh, within government, whether it's a minister or a senior civil servant, for example, like that thing is not going to happen. And the third circle I put was, um, it's a little bit more difficult to define. It's actually like the ecosystem. So whether you have um, cultural acceptance, whether the ecosystem, um, the, the, the civil service itself is open to it, um, whether or not the, the, the papers are going to be laid you know, out in time and you need to have the buy-in from certain individuals. So I think these are the three that make it workable. Um, if I were to think of something successful that actually happened uh, from IDEA's point of view, we actually did get all these three aligned, right? So if you remember, the Ministry of Finance came up with a pre-budget statement last year, which was the first time, and it was very widely celebrated it was celebrated because um, you know, having that is actually a, a way of being more transparent and accountable with the budget. And this is something that um, Ideas had like, called for for a very long time because uh, as Tunku Zain pointed out in his welcoming remarks, um, Ideas has been trying to champion budget transparency um, for a long time. And why is it that it couldn't happen right, over a period of 10 years or more? Um, so the solution was always there, the proposal was always there. But I think we had a, a good champion in government. I think the Minister of Finance did see that to have merit, and he had a good team of people as well. So the, the ecosystem of the civil servants within the Ministry of Finance, um, they suddenly, you know, it, it all came together. So sometimes the efforts that we put in, and I think it's really important for, for staff members as well, right? People who work in think tanks to remember, um, which is that the work of changing policy, it really doesn't happen quickly. Um, sometimes, a little bit of an idea is planted in the seat, in the mind of a certain person who maybe will climb up in the ranks of civil service over the period of 10 to 20 years. And finally, when he finds himself in the position of making decisions, then the idea is recalled. Like, oh, I had this conversation, you know, with uh, Dr. Kyril or Sharil 10 years ago, and now I'm in a position to do that. Now I'm in a position to change things. So the work of policy, it really is a long, a persevering one, and it, 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 can, it can happen, but it just needs yeah, a couple of factors to align. Uh, the other thing to point out is that we also recognize that there are idealistic goals, so this is the best that we can do. Sometimes we want to change the constitution, we want to change things, uh, but we know that it's not possible to get there, so we also have like low-hanging fruit. So you have, okay, if you can't get the gold mine, 
what are the different stages below that that can still be considered vict victories as far as reforms are concerned? Thanks. I, uh, yeah, I'd like to pick up on this. The, the question about theory um, uh, being theoretical and being, being practical, right? If I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yep. I, I'm, uh, well, I'm, I'm trained as a political theorist, so I think uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's just, you know, it's, theory is important uh, uh, in, 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 in the work of a think tank, especially when you're considering, for example, especially when you're considering um, um, solutions that you like to put forward um, to your stakeholders, right? Uh, there are a lot of nice solutions out there, uh, but it's important to, 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 to put them on the table uh, and to consider a lot of uh, questions that would be guided by theory. Would this solution actually work in the context of Malaysia? If you are plucking out a solution from, for example, a context that has a long history of uh, social democracy, for example, and Malaysia does not have a history of social, uh, you know, uh, social democratic practices, how exactly would you fit that kind of idea into uh, Malaysia, uh, even if it's a small policy idea. So these are the kind of stuff um, that um, will come with some theoretical sensibility um, in the researcher. Um, and that would help in the process of filtering out um, options um, that yeah, sound really nice but uh, wouldn't necessarily work. Um, but theory is important. I was actually reading a, an interview with uh, a fellow political theorist as well, um, who made the jump to a think tank as well. Um, back in, back when Ed Miliband was still uh, um, the leader of the Labour Party. Uh, and uh, fascinating interview. Uh, he said, uh, I was asked to come in uh, to Ed Miliband's policy team because they wanted some theory. Because for too long, um, there was this, um, uh, so there, there's this realization that for far too long, and I, I think this would challenge that Dr. Oi's point a little bit lah, about about um, um, reversing the de-technocratization of um, our policy making. Um, within the Labour Party, for far too long, they thought we've forgotten theory. Uh, you know, we've forgotten um, that aspect of articulation, our ideas, uh, so that uh, they would um, they would appear. Um, theoretically sound um, for too much um, um, playing to the gallery sort of tactic uh, when we are running for elections. And this is a result of a long history in the Labour Party, uh, especially um, with uh, uh, the leadership of Tony Blair. That was very technocratic. There's a lot of uh, research written about this. So he was brought in, he said specifically for that reason. Ed Milipan didn't win, lost to Cameron, but um, interesting interview. I thought uh, he talked about the kind of um, the kind of debates they had within the, that small team that was surrounding the leader of uh, Mille Ben was the who was the leader of opposition at that time. Um, and I think um, that's where theory actually uh, is very important. It guides the way we think uh, about um, our research. It guides our analysis, uh, and it controls all sorts of impulses that we have, you know, to come up with, um, we, we, we're always under pressure to come up with new ideas, right? That, that's one of the business of the think tank. La. We want to be a bit different, be alternative, this and that, right? But at the same time, there's got to be a check. Yeah. And, and that's, that's where it actually helps. Right. Okay. Let's move uh, on. Sorry, can I can I comment on a little bit on that? Because I think this is an interesting discussion, right? Like, kind of. Um, I think ideas itself has also gone through this journey of being probably more ideological in the past. Uh, we're less ideological today, but we are still guided by some of these uh, core core foundations. Um, but definitely much more pragmatic now. But I just wanted to touch on this idea that um, something that doesn't work in our cultural context even though it works in some other country that perhaps has gone through a longer social democracy. I think that's, that's true. Um, it's true that it may not work immediately, but I think it also still is important to look at international best practices. So that kind of balance, right, between finding out what has worked well in other multiple countries and also what hasn't worked well, actually. 
So we also need to look at, we need to also point out policy failures in other countries to ask ourselves the question of whether it's going to work here. Um, recently, Ideas was involved in this public debate over 5G, the 5G rollout, right? The whole single wholesale network. And I think that debate is still uh, continuing today uh, based on this morning's piece of news. So I think we need to strike that balance between um, looking at what has worked internationally or hasn't worked and then applying it to our case. Because I also don't want us to run into this, this um, problem of saying, oh, Malaysia is different, you know, like uh, we are an exceptional case and so we must have you know, exceptional kinds of policies. Sometimes we can take pages from other countries as well. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's move on with um, the questions. But uh, to all speakers, because we, we're about approaching the time, so if you can just pitch your answers about uh, 60 seconds, that would be great, because we want to try as much as we can, right? Okay, go on, Arif. Okay, Trisha. Elected members of the parliaments and elected government uh, and politicians elected to the government holds the mandate of the people who elected them. So what exactly is the mandate of think tanks for their perceived role as public problem solver? I like that question. Okay, so what gives us the right to represent the voices of people, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Um, well firstly I would say because our our entire organization is run on, on public funds um, and also contributions, right? So if you look at, and I think this comes back to the transparency of think tanks. So where do think, think tanks get funding from, right? So ideas, we have a, a principle of transparency. We have everything on our website. Um, we have our annual report, which puts, you know, where all the funds do come from. So um, our funds, are you know a range of different distributions and uh, most of it comes from it's, it's not some of it a small amount comes from uh, government but most of it comes from like public or even private uh, sources and i would say that we therefore um all we owe all of our research to the public and that's why we make it uh, very clear that everything that we do our output um, is really meant for public consumption. And uh, again, I go back to the kind of editorial independence that we strive very hard to achieve um, to ensure that we are not taking any particular site or other. Um, but that, that, that's a good question. I mean, who, who gives us the right to represent the voices? Um, nobody does, actually. I think, to be honest, nobody does, right? Nobody gives us that right. Um, so we can't claim... We can't claim ourselves to, to represent the voices of everyone, but what we do is we strive to remain accurate when we speak to specific subjects, right? So for example, um, if we are talking about refugee communities in Malaysia, we strive to represent the views based on the interviews that we've done. Um, on the ground, so you know that is like representative because it's primary research. Uh, the same goes for marginalized communities like the Orang Asli. So again, we, we would speak to the community. So that's why I said one of the points earlier, right? Um, that we need to speak to the subjects. Um, yeah, nobody gives us that right, okay. but we try as best but as we can based on the research that we do. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Next question, please. Okay, this question is not related to policy making, rather it is about the organization, the organization itself. So how do you see the pandemic affecting think tanks and were there any challenges and opportunities presented? And this question is open to all of the panelists. All right, I'll let uh, Shavil answer and uh, Dato Doctor to answer. Very quickly on this, please. Um, well, if I'm understanding the, the, the question correctly, uh, I think the, the, the role of the think tank has to be expanded, not just to be seen as a subject matter expert, but also on top of that, like communicators, networkers, managers, or the appreciation of all of that together. So uh, it has to be all encompassing enough, not just to deal with academics, but also uh, to make sure that they have access. I mean, we are linking the access to the right people. And even though our intention is to 
to be small, but imaginative enough to kind of like be transformative in terms of, um, you know, um, leading any specific um, agenda. Okay, Dr. Doctor, very quickly. Uh, yeah, um, what the question was about think tanks and how the pandemic has, has uh, affected our work, is that right? Yeah, more or less. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, Penang Institute, well, it has affected us greatly. Um, we, we, I think we, we were rather established in, in many ways already when COVID hit, in the sense that we had our range of, of uh, publicity channels. Yeah, uh, and I think when when the COVID hit, the, the, we felt very strongly the need to to uh, you know to capture data about what's happening out in society. Who are being affected? Are the are the single mothers being affected badly? Has um, household household violence increased and so on and so forth? So many of our our uh, our projects during the last two years have been partly of that type as well. Um, we, have a, we have a magazine, a monthly called Penang Monthly. And of course, through that, we were able to, you know, uh, raise issues that we think would concern people under lockdown and so on and so forth. And we, of course, we have our policy briefs that we continue to use in order to inform the state government, Penang state government on, on what issues we think are emerging and that need uh, immediate attention and so on. So th those, yes, so it, of course it affected us greatly. And uh, we were, before COVID hit, we had already started something called the Penang 2030. So mm -hmm. I think we were, the timing was good. We were, we had, we had a lot of initiatives already moving, including digitalization. And so with COVID coming, of course, as all of you know, suddenly you didn't need to convince anybody that the country has to digitalize on all fronts, right? Because everyone's using a phone, including great grandmothers. Um, right. And luckily, we, we were moving already in that direction and managed to get what we, Digital Penang, the, the state body to handle digitalization, started already in April 2020. So, right. uh, so in some ways, we were given a big boost in many of the directions we had already chosen before the pandemic itself. Right. So that right. that was. That that that's my answer to that. But uh, may I have half a minute to to add to the the, the question before? Very um, quickly, very quickly, yeah. Dato. Go ahead. Quickly. Um, no, wait, sorry, uh, that slipped my mind again. What that was on? Uh, never mind, slipped my mind. Okay, I'll, I'll shut up for now. <laughs> oh, no, please do. Uh, but regardless, I, I think um, I think the discussion uh, succeeds in answering some of the questions, if not all. Uh, but uh, I'm quite happy because it, it exposes the work of a think tank to all of our friends out there, to possibly university students who might want to consider think tanks as part of their career growth. Uh, and also to see how think tanks actually play its role uh, in a nation building process or a state building process, as Dr. Doctor has mentioned. Uh, so, yeah, thank you once again to all of our listeners and viewers from Facebook and from Zoom, also from the physical uh, viewers here in an AIAC, we truly greatly um, appreciate your participation and your presence. Before I pass the floor to Sal Sabla, I just want to make a promotion that the next topic is even, I wouldn't say more sexy, just because that Halmi is a very young, good-looking chap who will be moderating <laughs> later. But if you want to see on the political development in 2022 ahead of GE15, I think that you should stay on Twitter because the next topic that will start at 11.30 uh, has a lot of interesting things to cover and very thankful that we have the uh, chairman of Bursa here as well, Thomas Fan, that will be joining us on stage later. And if you want to know uh, what of this analytics is, what's happening in Johor, who will win in Johor or who will win in GE15, please stay uh, for the next session. With that, once again, on behalf of Ideas, on behalf of our founding presidents, we'd like to thank all our speakers, Dr. Dr. Oi from Penang, Shahril from I assume that you're from KL, um, Dr. Kyril, who's on stage with us, as well as Trisha uh, from Ideas. Thank you for all of your thoughts and perspective to our 
viewers who have still questions, we're still going to take that questions and we will have an internal discussion for us to reflect ourselves. And I'm, I'm very optimistic that I would like to see each and every of the panelists in the near future to discuss further on the role of the think tanks. With that, thank you so much for your understanding and your participation. Have a good day ahead. Stay safe. Wabilai taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Over to you, Sally. Thank you, Dr. Zakri. Thank you to all our esteemed speakers, Dr. Dr. Oiki Bang, Mr. Sharil, Mr. Sharil Sabaruddin, Dr. Kairil Izamin Ahmad, Mr. Shayo, and thank you to our moderator, Dr. Zakri Idris, and also co-moderator, Mr. Arif Najmuddin from Ideas, for such an insightful session.